Welcome everyone. Welcome to our recorded assessment workshop. In this session, Helen and myself will explore features of assessment, including strategies and approaches. So for now, before we move on to the agenda, let me just say hello um, and some welcomes. My name's Janet King. I'm the Sector Manager for Education and Childcare at NCFE. And Helen, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thanks, Janet, and hi, everybody. Yes, my name's Helen Scanlon. You can see our pictures on the screen now, just so you can put a face to a name. I'm part of the provider development team here at NCFE and work together with Janet quite closely to support the education and early years at TQ. We also have Gemma in our team. She's not with us today, but she'll be looking after the education and early years TQ moving forward. So just so you've got Gemma's name as well, you can see it on the screen now. I'll quickly share the agenda for this session. We're, we're doing the welcome and introductions now. We're going to do an overview of the T-level assessment methodologies, looking at the assessment of the core, including the employer set project. We're going to have a brief look at assessment objectives and, and talk about confidence building with exam techniques that you can use with your students. There'll be some opportunity for a bit of a review and feedback. We run this session live where we were in a centre and we went for a centre visit. Obviously, we're not doing that in the studio recording. We are going to move on to do an exploration of the Chief Examiner Report and then we're going to do um, a bit of activity with you. We're going to ask you to do some um, considerations in relation to what we did in the live session in terms of setting questions and preparing your students for the core assessment. Quickly going to share the outcomes of this session, which you can see on the screen now. We want to explore the Education Early Years Assessment Models look at the core assessment and how to prepare students for those assessment activities. We're going to summarise and explore what the chief examiner reports tell us about the core example, um, the core assessment, sorry. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to have a bit of time and support just to plan some activities that you could use with your students for assessment preparation. I know this is a recording, but we are going to mirror what we did in the live session, just so that we share it with everybody. And the KWL sheet asks you about what you already know about the topic. So if you have a piece of paper and a pen handy, please make some notes regarding, well, what do you know about the assessment of the education early years um, technical qualification? And what do you want to know about it? Uh, this is a handy tool to use in a classroom with students that are of mixed abilities or that you don't know very well or that you really want to make sure that you adapt and differentiate and target the session in a way that identifies what they already know but what they want to know about the topic so you can tailor it to to their your students needs we also encourage you then to write about what you learned from the session and then finally what would be your key takeaways and next steps so a structured initial assessment, a way of teachers to find out what the students want to know about the topic and what they already know, what they actually learned during the session, and then what they're going to take away from the session in relation to the next steps. So building on some reflection and developing the learning further outside of the classroom. Okay, we're going to do a brief introduction to the assessment methodologies for, for the technical qualification for the T-level in, in, in its entirety. So you will hear us talking about the technical qualification or TQ, and that's what uh, NCFE has the contract for with IFAT for the T-level and education in early years. It's also made up of the industry placement, uh, and we all know how many hours that is, especially for the early years specialism. And then many TQs, have, or many technical T-levels, sorry, have additional industry requirements, but for education in early years, there aren't any. And that could be something like a health and safety certificate or something similar. All of those come together to create the T-level. And the T-level is what is owned by IFAT. And this is just an example of how the technical qualification that we look after, we have the contract for at NCFE for education and early years, how it fits into the overall T-level. I'm going to hand over to Janet now for an overview of the assessments. 
Thank you. Thanks, Helen. So, as most of you will know, on, and some of you may be looking forward to finding out, the overview of the um, assessment in those occupational specialisms, so for either um, occupational specialism, all students will be involved in the core. So whether you've got early years educator students or assisting teaching students in the education and early years um, T level, all students will sit two exams or two exam papers. It will be classed as one um, overall methodology. Paper A is going to be elements one to six and paper B elements seven to 12. Now, if you are teaching in a very holistic way, please don't worry about the elements being split in this way. It's literally to compensate for two sittings of an exam paper, um, both of which are two hours in duration. All of those questions are going to benefit from a holistic approach to answering them, but it gives an idea of where the emphasis might be in terms of preparing your students. But that holistic approach and how answers can be um, responded to and approached is, is very much holistic to the whole of that core um, year. So the, the 12 elements there. As well as doing that, and most people, the delivery of this and, and when you um, sit for those examinations is very much down to down to you and how you want to plan for that. And we'll look at that as the as this session unfolds. But the employer set project is also something that is typically taken at the end of that first year, at the end of that core 12 element teaching sessions. Um, and the students will choose from a themed scenario, a project that is focused on assisting teaching or one that is focused on early years educator. And from that, we are thinking employer set project is something that's actually validated by the employers. So the scenario um, or the case study that the students will be basing their, their responses around is something that's been seen by either um, those working in, in classroom, working as a teacher, a teaching assistant, alternatively by those working in the early years setting to make sure that the papers are validated, they're as up to date and as realistic as possible. Now, in reality, the students will have done um, some placement across education in early years, but the emphasis here is on the application of knowledge to a given situation. So, I would say arguably that placement always helps technical vocational students to make sense of what they're learning about. I think it helps us all in any situation. But if a student has done limited time in their assisting teaching, for example, or, or indeed early years educator and um, placements, then they should still be able to have to join in with the employer set project with the, from the same starting point because this is an application of the knowledge that they have been learning about in their um, in their core. So the occupational specialisms also have um, assessment involved in them, and so assignment one, which is um, for both early years educator and assisting teaching, there'll be three. Um, and the difference there that will jump out of you, uh, jump out at you straight away, is that in assignment two for the early years, they will have a part one as well as part two. And that is aligned to the early years educator competency criteria, those DFE and um, EYE criteria. And um, for the assisting teaching, they will just have their structured observations as part of their second year. Thank you, Helen. So if we look at this, we can see quite clearly on this next slide how the build of what those assessments might look like. Um, so let's let's take a look at this. So the teaching and learning is going to be happening between September of that first year. We're thinking first year first, that makes sense. Um, and they're going to be teaching right through until the end of April. So that gives you an idea of planning, of how you're going to make sure that you've got the coverage. 
And then there are two windows here that you can see for the results that are coming in from those exams and employer set projects. Now the industry placement, I think it's fair to say that in education and early years, the industry placement is going on all the way through. You can be a little bit more agile and flexible, I think, with your assisting teachers, because, with assisting teaching, because that's the 315 and, and you've got that, that um, 750 requirement, of course, in the early years educator. And it's important to, to remember that so that students are out on placement um, as, soon, as soon as possible. Then when we think about the early years assignment two, part one, remember this is about those competencies. And this is almost, if you've been um, doing a, a sort of a, a qualification at the moment in early years that has unit 16 or the practice portfolios in, some sort of evidence record that's been following the student in their placement, observing the student, having those professional discussions with the student to gain those competencies, that continues. And, and, and that must start with the Early Years Educator Assignment 2 Part 1 in the first year so that you're not leaving all of those assessor judgments until year two because that would just make it um, quite a, um, an uphill struggle. So we have the ESP and the exam summer series taking place there. And then we move on to the second year. So the occupational specialism input and industry placement continues in just the same way. Now the input of the occupational specialism in the uh, qualification spec is, is, is arranged as performance outcomes. So you'll see that there are five performance outcomes or POs for the early years educator and there are four for the um, assisting teaching and so you would teach through that you would work through that all of that teaching and learning is absolutely going to be anchored to the teaching and learning in the core but there'll be the opportunity to wallow in the um in the in the actual area that you're focusing on in your specialism EYE assignment two part one and preparation for that um, still continues here so EYE, assignment two, part one, all of those competencies, remember, they are still taking place. This is where your student is blossoming um, in their competencies and their confidence in an early years uh, setting. And then we're looking at those um, wraparound assignments and all of the assignments in the occupational specialism are very much concerned with bringing that theory and practice together. So assignment one, assignment two part two in the early years which are the three structured observations and then the assignment three for the early years students is taking place here in this time scale but all of the um, the students so the assisting teaching students you can see here they're going to have assignment one um, and assignment three coming in within that same time slot and they're going to be studying for their um, assignment to structured observations as well. And you can see there how the results and how the series, the autumn series and the summer series, where you've got these windows of opportunity to be able to enter your students. This is all at your discretion when you choose to do so. Um, but obviously, if you leave any of the first year, what I would say, the core exams and the um, employer set project, if you leave any aspects of those into the second year, then the opportunities for resets, et cetera, are minimized. Okay. So let's think about the structure of these exams. So there are two parts. We've, we've looked at that. They are split into a paper A and paper B but they must in any series be sat together. It is one paper and it's the duration of time really that's, that's um, split this into two halves. So we have two parts of, the, of one paper, paper A, paper B. 
They're sat close together in time duration within the, um, the key date schedule and you'll be able to, to look at that and see when those timings are for each entry. Elements one to six are tested quite logically in a section A, in part A, paper A, and seven to 12 in paper B. But as I said, there will always be that opportunity to look wider at the core within any answer response that the student gives. There are three different types of questioning, different types of questions. And these are split here really into multiple choice. So those sorts of questions that are looking at those assessment objectives that test and challenge the recall. We're looking at things that are very factual, true, false. One answer is going to be um, the, 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 the answer that's correct and the others are uh, detractors and so on. Then we have um, short answer questions and these are the types of questions that are really engaging with assessment objective two. So that just literally means we're going a little bit deeper than the, um, the, the definition of something. We're looking now into building on that definition and maybe describing or explaining something and those tend to be the verb commands that those types of questions begin with. And then we have the more involved extended um, questions. And these are looking for a student to, again, those building blocks of assessment one, where we're, we're sort of identifying, defining um, and making, making a, a, a claim on something. We're then going into the explaining or describing of, of something and we're then maybe evaluating, analysing, we're making comparisons, we're discussing and considering um, the, the question and so we're adding a little bit more detail and that's how the student will be approaching those extended type uh, of answers. So this is going to show us how the papers are actually arranged. So each paper is split into four sections, A, B, C and D. And so it will clearly say section A and what section A is concerned with in terms of the element. It will then give you um, the indication of marks how many um, marks are available for each question and they are absolutely relatable to the assessment objectives and therefore the type of question that the students will be answering. Remember to remind the students about the QWC, the quality of written communication and how those extra additional marks can be gained. So, each paper will assess how the students have achieved the following assessment objectives. And this is the assessment objective one. Demonstrate knowledge and understanding of context, concepts, theories and principles in education and childcare. So we're making the right decisions. We're answering the question with the right sorts of information and context. Applying that knowledge and understanding. So we're beginning to explain it, we're rationalising, we're reasoning, concepts, theories, principles in education and childcare to different situations and contexts, showing an application of that knowledge and understanding. So do we know it? Assessment objective one. Can we apply it to a range of contexts? And then finally, in assessment objective three, can we analyse and evaluate the information and those issues in the same context? So we're building and we're demonstrating that deeper knowledge um, and understanding of those theoretical concepts. So what about the employer set project? Well, the employer set project, again, covers all of those 12 core elements. So it is set by NCFE and it's going to be validated by employers. And we very much stress um, that doing mocks or practicing using all the different types of um, tasks and approaches to the employer set project will really, really support your students as they become more familiar. And we'll explore what we mean by those different types of assessment methods as we go through the session. 
So let's explore this e ESP. And I want to say thank you at this stage to Helen because Helen's put together this great myth buster and it's, um, it's quite an interesting one. So let's test, let's test ourselves here. So the ESP is completed at the industry placement. True or false? What do we think? NCFE provide feedback on all the ESP tasks. So you need to make sure that you are very familiar with the requirements of the ESP tasks and what any roles and responsibilities you may have. The evidence for each student must be uploaded to the NCFE portal. Task three must be audio recorded. Students must use a reflection template for task four. The total time allowed for completion of the ESP is 12 hours. Task two is broken down into four parts. After task 1b, every task relates to the activity plan that the students create. Students must clearly reference all sources and websites used. And providers tell us how much their students dislike the ESP. So we've got all the answers on there now, Janet, but a couple of them have, I've got a star or might need a little bit of more explanation. Um, okay. okay, okay. And the first thing I want to say as well is that on task four, where, where you could say, well, you know, they are being audio recorded, but m remember that moving forward, they will be uh, video recorded also. Um, so that's just something to bear in mind. So that okay. was question four, but it's task three that needs to be. Task um, three, sorry. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So um, where we're looking at that time allowed for completion, remember that some of those tasks, some of those individual tasks have also been allocated certain time durations and so on. And um, was there anything you wanted to add to that, Helen? Not so much the time, the, the, there are very, um, clear guidelines about which task mm -hmm. has allocated time but some of them don't have allocated time so it's, yes exactly it's true that they do they have 12 hours in total but there's a, there are additional tasks that don't have timings so that's why that's true with a little asterisk there brilliant um, i think it's handy to remember that task eight yes every sorry question eight um after task one b every task in the esp relates to the activity plan yes it does but they will also have access to other documents at the same time so they'll look at other people's uh, the, the fellow students activity plans but also they'll have their notes and they'll also have their um their intervention plan won't they as well that that's they're thinking what, about yes, that's the what's the one um <laughs> And obviously the ESP, ESP is not completed at the placement, it's completed in centre. Um, we do ask you to, or you ask, we ask the provider staff to do some feedback on some of the ESP tasks. For example, the student um, presents the, the plan to a tutor in a role play type activity for task three and we ask you to provide feedback on the student's communication skills there. So that's why um, that one would be false. All of the evidence must be uploaded to the NCFE portal once the uh, ESP is finished. As Janet said, for question four, task three must now be video recorded and not just audio recorded. Students are allowed to use a reflection template for task four, but they, it's not mandatory. So um, the, you don't, we, we don't insist they use a template, it's, it's personal choice. Um, and uh, I think for, for question 10 there, we'll, we'll finish on a positive. Um, yes. Every provider tells tell us how much their students enjoy doing the ESP. They like it. They feel it is um, an, a nice project where they can apply all that knowledge and understanding that they've been learning in the core to a real life example, if you like, of 
um, a, a task that would be carried out in the industry. Would you agree with that, Janet? Absolutely. I, I've got to say, hand on heart, when I was looking at it and you kind of you put yourself in the shoes of, of a young learner and I thought there's a lot going on here. Um, but actually, the students have applied themselves in a very strong way um, and, and the outcome of, of that in their results is, is definitely showing to date. So, yeah, I would absolutely echo what you said. Um, so. What's the purpose of the ESP then? Why do we need an employer set project? The reasoning behind this is that we want to make sure that students are learning, but they're learning in such a way that they're carrying on and taking forward a competency based approach. So, yes, we need all of that knowledge, but we need all of that knowledge to be able to apply that in um, an occupation. So whether that's as a teaching assistant or whether that is as an early years educator, this is about gaining those skills and improving those skills all the way through from the very beginning um, of the assessment process towards that occupational application. So as I said before, um, students who haven't set foot in placement will not be or should not be disadvantaged because it's an application of knowledge of what they're learning in the core in a given situation. Um, however, we all know that technical vocational students really blossom from their experience and early year students in particular will need to have started their um, placement and assignment two part one in, and get that running as soon as, soon as they can, um, probably within that first term even of starting the T level. So the idea of this and the purpose of this is all about bringing together that theory to be able to apply that knowledge and understanding in any given context. Okay, I'm going to talk us through the actual uh, tasks of the ESP now in um, task by task or step by step uh, approach. There are there are pre-release material which um, is made available to providers before the start of the live window. And it's, as you can see on the screen now, it's three weeks before the window opens. There is some pre-release research that the students will carry out. When the live window does become open, the project brief and some information, more, more information about the, the project and the, the child or young person that's involved in it is released. And the students use their research that they've carried out already the project brief and their knowledge and understanding that they've gained in the core to create an early support or intervention plan. And as you can see, there are three hours of supervised time designated to that first task. Once they've done that, they'll create an activity plan based on their early support or intervention plan um, and the project brief and the research and the core knowledge and understanding. And they will create a plan for a child or young person related to this brief. Once they've done that, they're going to pr present their plan to their peers. They're going to be in small groups of three to five, which you as providers will form. You, you put the groups together and there is a pro forma that they'll fill in, which is about preparing for that peer discussion. So in their little group, they're going to be sharing their plans with each other. You're going to be sharing the plans and they're going to prepare for a discussion about them. That preparation plan uh, form that they've completed, they can um, get it, submit, submit it to yourselves for some feedback and some guidance. Um, and then they will be able to use that feedback and guidance to, to, to prepare and develop the plan a bit more if, if need be. They then actually take part in a group discussion the timings are estimated here. It's about five minutes to present their plan to their peers and then four minutes to answer questions from each of their peers in the group. Every student must present their plan to their group. Every student must answer questions about their plan and every student in the group must ask every other student a question. So it's, it's quite important that centre staff know that, know that this is happening and ensure that everybody can participate and that 
everybody in the group isn't going to ask exactly the same question, for example, so that they have a meaningful peer discussion um, about the plans that they've created. And then once they've done that, they'll reflect on that discussion and the feedback that they got off, off their peers, uh, and they will update their plan. And if they get any feedback that they don't use because they have a justification about why they're not going to do something, that's just as important to reflect on because it will help them to, to carry out those reflections but also do analysis and evaluation. So it's, it's really encouraging the students to, to think about what they've done, why they've done it, what their peers have, have suggested that they do to develop it further um, and why they've, they've taken ideas on board or not depending on um, the individual circumstances. We then move on to task three. They're then going to prepare for a professional discussion and that'll be with a teacher um, or a tutor who knows the subject area very well. So it could very well be yourselves if you're their, their tutors, but they're going to prepare for this presentation to uh, their teacher. Now, we kind of call this a role play activity. The teacher takes on the persona of a, a manager or a supervisor in a work context. They're not the teacher anymore. They role play um, the part of a manager or, or senior member of staff. They then, as, as Janet said earlier, and we're talking about the quiz there, that it, this is a recorded discussion. It's a video recorded discussion where they have 15 minutes where we recommend five minutes to present the plan to the, the tutor in this role play activity. And then there's, there's a 10 minute question and answer section where the teacher will be provided with some questions to standardize the, the question process. Um, and they are able, however, to adapt those questions if the students don't understand and if they ask for them to be rephrased. But tutors are not allowed to share those questions in advance of task three. So please always refer to the tutor guidance and the qualification specific instructions for all of the regulations um, on the conduct of this. It's recommended that the students do a PowerPoint pre presentation or something similar. It shows their digital skills because we haven't mentioned them yet, but English, maths and digital skills are also involved and included in the assessment of the, the TQ. So a short five minute presentation to, to yourself as the tutor is, is recommended. And we're also asked if students can use cue cards. Um, the advice from the examiners is that they don't use cue cards. They might have prompt cards, very brief, so long as they're not reading directly or verbatim from some notes or from, from cards. It should be a more free flowing discussion because that's what would happen in the industry. And then once they've done that, they will reflect on the project, their end plan, how it developed, what they learned taking part in the peer discussions, the, the peer reviews of each other's plans, the professional discussion about the plan and how they presented it in the role play activity. We would, we'll come back to this later, but we would recommend that it's not just a list of what they did. Um, it's a reflection on the quality of what they did, how they learned and developed during the tasks, why they made the changes and developments to the plans that they did, um, and what they're going to learn and use going forwards in the future. Janet, have I missed anything about the ESP? I don't think so. I think breaking it down, because I love this slide, but breaking it down like that um, really does help, I think, in terms of the, the distinct approaches to it. We're, we're, we're creating an intervention plan that's helping us to make sense of the situation. We're then uh, devising an activity that, that's going to be relatable to that, but that's going to focus on something with the child or children. We're then looking at how we re put that together and share it with others. We're then reflecting on that and we're taking part in um, a discussion with our tutors before reflecting on the whole thing. So I think once we get our head around the actual purpose and the flow and of, of the different components, um, all becomes clear. And, and I think that side really helps to, to do that. Thanks, Helen. So on this slide, you can see, um, a range of the of the different materials that are available and those additional materials that are that are available so there's 
there's examples of things we've been told that there's so much on the website and 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 there is so it's knowing where to go and where to look for things so just we just wanted to bring this to your attention that there are some examples there are some um some things that you can look at there that will show you a grade a grade c and a grade so top, middle, bottom, if you like, for the for the sake of ease, for the employer set project there, and um, one for the early years educator, and one for assisting teaching. So if you if you look at those, if you find those, you've got a link there that will help you. But they're in the support materials section. You, you sometimes these things are hard um, to find, when, especially when we're busy. So you would look in the support materials, and then you would look to find some exemplar employer set project materials, and they're there for both um, EYE and assisting teaching. And of course, they're useful to yourselves, but you can also show them to your students and use them in ESP prep activities as well, if you want. Fantastic. So on this slide, which has been taken from the most current qualification spec on page 23, but um, moving forward, the, the specification, etc., might change, but the core skills will always be there somewhere uh, and hopefully around this page. So um, what you can see here through these core skills, remember the purpose of the employer set project and the core skills can be demonstrated through the student's application of knowledge. So when preparing for the employer set projects with your students, just try and remember the core skills. They could easily be forgotten, I think. So you need to make sure that these are considered as they will be marked, they will carry some marks. So we've got communication, working with others. So how are the students able to show this and becoming familiar um, and with, with, with how to talk about things like this, write about things like this, or indeed talk about them in, um, in their presentation, communicating information, working with others, using formative and summative assessment, how to assess and manage risk. So thinking about how to keep uh, children safe. So thinking about these as core skills in the context of the um, the education and early years sectors and making sure that those are in there really do help to show the application of core skills that's something to something to bear in mind i think when when you're preparing for your esp okay so let's take a look then at some of the assessment objectives and your confidence with these different types so let's remind ourselves what we meant by assessment objective so we introduced the term earlier on um, assessment objective a o and we looked at those in three different ways so what are they assessment objectives refer to the skills that you need to be demonstrated in responses to questions usually in an examination so it's usually about some sense of, of level of depth and um, the expectation so what are the assessment objectives that are used in the education and early years t level let's take a look so we've talked about ao1 assessment objective one two and three and how these build in the types of questions that might be aligned to them. So remember that assessment objective one that's looking at that sort of the, the, um, the shallow depth, if you like, of understanding, you're demonstrating your knowledge and understanding, and that's usually seen in a multiple choice question, for example, and it'll be relatable to the marks assigned to it when you're thinking about being able to apply that knowledge we're usually thinking about explaining or describing something we're applying the knowledge and we're giving it some reasoning and that is something that's applicable to assessment objective two and it's usually a short answer type question when we think about assessment objective three we're thinking about those deeper understanding the the students who can analyze who can evaluate um, in terms of the question and what it's what's being asked and so sometimes they're giving wider a demonstration of wider knowledge and they're able to to consider and discuss with, with some introduction of analysis and evaluation there as well but students should always think about approaching the the questions in a similar way perhaps that allows for that build from one 
two and three, rather than um, look at assessment three and feel that they don't know how to unpick it, for example. So when we were doing um, when we were doing this live, we were looking at the command verbs, weren't we, Helen, and thinking how would one assessment objective be seen um, through the types of verbs that we might use in a question. Absolutely. So, so yeah, so a summary of that then, um, to unpick the questions and the type of command verbs um, can be seen on the table now. So you've got the example command verbs on that right hand column. Um, and you've got those AOs in the left hand column that Janet's been talking about. And then an overview of which would typically be the multiple choice questions where they have to choose, identify, indicate, etc. The short written answer, they're going to be applying, comparing, describing all words that Janet was saying earlier. And then for AO3, you've got those reflection skills, the analysis, assessment and evaluate. Um, and those are your higher mark questions. So encouraging your students to really pull apart why um, things happen the way they do or don't happen the way they they don't. Um, it's really <laughs> important to make that come to life. And, you know, instead of just saying this is the fact, it's this is the fact. Why is this the fact? How does this impact on, on practice? What would you do with that piece of information in that context or scenario? Janet, I'm going to let you talk about this next one linked to Bloom's yeah. taxonomy. Yeah, absolutely. So again, you can see on this um, hierarchy um, and the way that students might apply and build and, and develop their, their knowledge from the the recall, the remembering, the being able to say, oh, yep, that's associated with legislation. And I'm going to say that it's the Child Care Act 2006. You know, they're remembering a fact, they're remembering something and recalling it. They're bringing it as we move through this um, taxonomy here and as we move through this understanding and level of understanding to the assessment objective too, we're doing that, we're building from that, but we're showing that understanding through an application. We might give examples, we might be able to refer to something that um, we've we've done we've worked on in class. We might be able to think about something that we've thought about and experienced in our placement experience. So all of these things come into play, and we're beginning to explain what it is we remember, what it is we recall, what it is we understand through that application. Now. Obviously, as the student um, gains their, their study skills and most questions, I've got to say, will be around that AO2 because that is where, um, you know, the, the typical level three student, for the want of a better description, is, is going to be. They're going to be recalling something and they're going to be applying something. But, but a lot of students will also begin to analyse. They'll also begin to evaluate They'll create their own ideas. They'll be able to draw conclusions from their work. And this is how that sort of hierarchy and moving up and down the Bloom's taxonomy. And I say moving up and down because students will feel more confident with different areas of their study than others. And um, just as anybody would feel more confident in certain subject areas at um, assessment objective one or two, some students will feel very confident in certain aspects um, and, and may put themselves or demonstrate AO3. And, and, and so overall, when these when the questions are marked, the, the student will get a fair aggregation of their overall holistic achievement. So if we think about um, just reminding ourselves here of what those elements are. So we've talked about paper A and paper B being divided into two papers with different sections, four sections in each, each paper being two, um, two hours in duration. They're going to be sat in a very sort of close together window, but not on the same same day, for example, but just reminding ourselves of what those um, elements are. And of course, when you're thinking about these, um, these questions, when you're preparing, then also remembering to, to try and, and consider how in past papers, for example, the assessment objectives have been demonstrated and how they've been shown. And you can see that greater weighting there in that um, AO2 on the right hand side in that second table. 
So that's a really good way of being able to think about what's an assessment objective one, what type of question, what type of verb command. We've looked at all of that as we've been going through the session um, today. What's assessment objective two, what's assessment objective three, and what type of um, questions. And then you can see there that equal um, weighting on the, um, the way that it's put together and aggregated at, at the end of the four hours in total. It's important to note that um, the exams, if, if, if a student was to resit, then they would resit both papers because, as I say, this is one methodology, it's one assessment method that has been split for, um, for, for ease of, of, for the student and to, to keep it as straightforward as possible into two sittings. Thanks, Janet. So we're now going to start looking at the actual questions or the actual type of questions and and discuss or explore and share some strategies that you, you might be able to use that you've used in the past that would um, possibly a reminder of what you could do. And we're going to start with multiple choice. So our first piece of advice or a first strategy that you could use with your students is to, to, to consider answering the multiple choice questions, but without even looking at the choices first. This should help the students think a bit more deeply about it beforehand. And we're just going to quickly demonstrate what we mean here with an example question. So we've got an example question on the screen now. We'd like you to think about it. It's generic. It's not linked to the qualification at all. But we'd like you to think, OK, there's the question. Where might I go with that? What might I think it be? Think about it without any options yet. It's a recall question. Once you've got the answers, or once you've got your choices, you could then use the process of elimination. So we're going to show the, show the choices in a second. But if you've had to think about it without the choices first, do you have an idea? What's your thoughts? Um, but then once we give you the answers, let's use the process of elimination. So there's the question along with its four choices. We've got um, a Queen, popular, very popular song. We've got a Christmassy song, which was very popular too. We've got a Cliff Richard hit um, called Summer Holiday. I think we can eliminate that one straight away. Then we've got a, a children's favourite, Bob the Builder, uh, Can We Fix It? So I would imagine you would have thought it would be a Christmassy song if it was a Christmas, you know, the best selling Christmas song. So Using the process of elimination, we'll take out summer holiday. I'm not sure if Can We Fix It was around at Christmas time. Bohemian Rhapsody might have been around at Christmas time, but it might have been re-released. I'm not sure. But to me now, thinking about it without the answers, I thought, hmm, probably a Christmas song. So, yes, we can, we can confirm that as of today, the, the best selling um, UK Christmas song is Do They Know It's Christmas? So, you know, just pulling apart the, the thought processes you can go through without looking at the answers first, you know, covering up those answers and not sharing them, not looking at them until you've really thought the question through. It does make you think about it a bit more deeply. Obviously, sample questions are really useful, but using sample questions with students in a way that doesn't just ask them what's the right answer, it's okay, then why are those not the right answer? Why are the detractors there? Why might it be the right answer? And having those conversations with them to build their understanding of how to eliminate answers um, effectively as well. So it might be for something that very simply comes to the mind really quickly, but if it doesn't, having those sample questions to really talk to them about and get them to, to think more deeply about it and what strategies they can use to actually make an informed choice. Something that I've seen with an Ofsted inspector before is the students writing their own questions for each other to answer. So finishing off a unit or a module or an element in this case, and then ask the teacher asking the students to write some multiple choice questions with the correct answer, obviously happen to be one of the choices, but also get them to think about what the incorrect answers are or, and why they are. Get, put them into the position of the exam paper writer so it builds their confidence in their ability to be able to answer them um, themselves. And then there's obviously lots of generic advice in, in relation to 
revision of each of the 12 elements. They know they're going to be tested on elements one to six and paper A. So um, focusing on one to six, elements one to six um, and, and maybe it's rag rating the different elements so that they can pick apart. Well, what do I not know much about? What do I need to focus my revision on so that I feel more empowered when it comes to the actual question? So there's lots of things you can do with a multiple choice question that is not simply answering it. There's a question, answer it's done in five to 10 seconds. However, there's a lot of things we can do in terms of teaching and learning to prepare the students uh, effectively to actually answer a multiple choice question. It's not just a guess. Unless you run out of time, you can talk about timing, um, uh, manage, time management during the exam. If you're not sure, if you come across a question, you've thought it through and you're not sure, move on and come back to it because you, you, know, you know what humans are like. We might think a bit further and a bit deeper into something and then something will make sense. Oh, I can go back to that multiple choice one now. I've just remembered because of a later question what the answer is. So those are some multiple choice questions. I'll talk through the short answer questions now and then I'll ask Janet to talk through the extended answer questions. So some of the advice includes that the students should focus their answer in one or two or three to four sentences. It's a short answer. The clue is in the title. It's not um, a big piece of writing. Um, and we've got to remember what they are showing in their answer. They're demonstrating the knowledge and understanding of something. So to help with that, they could take note of the keywords, phrases, terms that are in the question to make them focus on what it is. And pulling out what the keywords are is an activity that you can help them with as teachers in their revision activities. Phrase the answers so that they rephrase the questions. So it does help the students. This is a, an English um, strategy where they can pick out the keywords for the question and use them to formulate their answer um, and it will help them to stay focused on what the essential terms are and, and turn those into statements. We really encourage them to practice checking for accuracy and meaning. There's a lot of um, writing that happens that doesn't get properly proofread and checked. We, we all do it. We're all human beings. So we need to ensure that we practice checking that what the answer actually says is what the student wants it to say. So pulling apart with the peers and each other uh, and yourself, of course, in, in terms of that checking. Uh, obviously, spelling, punctuation and grammar does have an impact on meaning. So that comes into that checking, but it's it's slightly different. It's not just about is this are the spellings, is the punctuation, is the grammar right, is the meaning there as well. So there's two different things. And then the last piece of advice uh, or strategy is to encourage the students not to overwrite or ramble. Um, going back to the very first point on this one, if there are two marks assigned to the question that normally asks for um, an identification and an application or a bit of both. So there are two things that they need to say. If there are three or four marks for a question, that has an impact on how much the question is asking or expecting of the student from their answer. So having a good look at the marks available and using that to help inform what they put in their answer is also a useful tool. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. So extended writing. Let's remind ourselves um, what, what we actually mean by that and how we break down those assessment objectives from assessment objective one, two and three. So what are the students doing in this type of, of response? What are they looking for? Remember, they're making sense. They're beginning to analyse and evaluate the information. They are starting, remember how, how we looked at that AO1 and that build up to AO3, there is absolutely strength in beginning with that assessment objective one, Look, thinking about identifying something, maybe starting with a bit of a list, maybe starting with some definition, that's fine. And then being able to perhaps, yeah, thinking about the wording of the question as the basis. If we don't know where to start, let's think about defining something in the context of what the question is asking us. And then thinking about, okay, if I describe, is there anything in there I can describe meaning, um, giving meaning to that context? Uh, any examples I can think of? And 
then thinking wider about maybe comparing, you know, showing some beginnings of analysis, evaluating, let's think about the what ifs um, and, and so on, so that we can actually begin to attempt to take it a little bit further and to draw conclusions from it. Remember, at the, at the, um, at the stretch there of, of Bloom's taxonomy. So, we're still explaining, we're still describing, we're still identifying, and we are able to do that as we go through. So actually, literally using that as a technique, using those building blocks or that process as a technique to be able to work our way through those different assessment objectives from number one, right through to number three and remembering of course the importance of um of those core skills and also the quality of the written communication remember i think there was around 12 marks for that so if you've got the time if the student has the time proofreading looking at the meaning have they meant what what they've said is that what the question's asking for what about the fullness and the richness of, of that answer um, is there anything else you that the student could pop in there and of course, giving attention to any um, spelling and grammar um, errors that they may have identified as they do that proofreading. So what about the key challenges and the common mistakes? Okay, so let's work our way through the, so consider and predict. Okay, let's think, what have we got on our list here, Helen? Let's take a look um, at some of these things. So. You can think about um, this when you're working with your students, encouraging students to use technical language correctly. And these are things that are going to be um, in both exams. So we're considering, is it is this part of an exam? Is this part of the ESP or is it both? Um, and in this case, we're encouraging students to use that professional language in the, in the correct context, um, whether it's the exam, or whether it's the ESP. Clear handwriting and structure, very, very much something that's going to be used in that approach in the exams. Of course, it's important throughout, but when we think about the exam in particular, and that's why we've got that in this category here, we're thinking about that AO1, AO2, AO3, is it building, is it flowing, is it following that, that format to be able to gain and maximize um, the points available to the student? Applying theory to practice effectively and appropriately. This is absolutely key to any technical and um, vocational qualification, isn't it? So being able to show um, the competency, to demonstrate that competency and to do so through the way that you write, whether that's your examples in, in from your placement experience or whether that's um, putting that into the context of the given scenario in the uh, ESP here, for example. Using age appropriate responses, absolutely. And we've said both here because you've you you know you've got to remind the student to read that question and to make sure they're reading that they're reading it slowly they're reading it carefully and they're remembering to keep going back to think oh okay they wanted two examples of an activity for physical development oh but I've given something that actually is not the appropriate um, and not at the appropriate stage for for the age that they've asked for so things like that. Carrying out evaluation and analysis, practicing some of these with your students, really understanding what those words mean and, and how they build naturally from AO1 and AO2 so that they don't look like it's out of reach, but the next logical step in their answer. And fully exploring all the aspects of the question as well. So making sure that when they read a question, they're able to you to apply a technique of okay um, how many points is this what kind of verb is this is this an AO1 AO2 AO3 what type of question and then being able to think about how they can approach answering that question so they're using their knowledge in a very logical way and um, through a structured approach and technique to ex to exams can help a lot of students applying their knowledge and understanding to the project. So 
very much seen through that employer set project and if it helps in exam situations to apply knowledge then you know fine but that's usually to a given statement here in this um in the employer set project is is more likely that they're able to show the application of their knowledge to a given situation always be objective professional reflective analytical so that they are um, yes, they may well draw, draw conclusions as part of their um, analytical and evaluative learning journey. That is absolutely true. But being able to reflect on that, being able to see things from different viewpoints and remaining professional in how they approach the answers and responses to the questions. And defining those key terms. So fully explain points and make reasoned judgments. If your answer, if the student's answer is going to be worth more than what you would associate with a multiple choice type answer. So they're looking for, it's a short answer that's looking for a reason judgment. Then, you know, are we making it clear and not leaving anything to um, to assumption of what the uh, examiner is going to, to fill in in the gaps? Um, assume nothing and give as much reason judgments for why you've chosen the answer that you have and so on. Absolutely, and it, that's a really good time to bring in. We're going to be looking at the chief examiner reports next because um, really pulling apart what they mean, but there's a lot of reference made to making those reasoned judgments, not making judgments that aren't backed up by something. Exactly. You know, saying why, 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 why is, is the question. So <laughs> we've got we've got some example resources that I'm just going to quickly talk through just to help with some of the things that we've just been talking about. So this first example is a crossword puzzle, um, which focuses on the, the key terms and meaning of, of core element one. So very easily produced on, on free online sites. I mean, I think this one was done with uh, discovery.com, but getting students to do cross, cross, crosswords for each other to do, but you know, having a, a fun way to, to do a bit of recap, because throughout the year, you'll need to recap and revisit uh, earlier elements taught as you get nearer the exam. So things like crossword puzzles. Um, we've got a case study here, which has um, terms linked to reflection and how this practitioner in this case study, a nice, simple and unthreatening way to introduce a scenario to allow the students to pull apart why why things happen and why they, they happen in a certain way. So getting case studies that they could create from, from their work placement might be an idea as well. So not just teachers creating case studies, but uh, students creating anonymized case studies for, for them to learn from each other. And then last of all, the kind of the easiest one is um, a well-being and safeguarding um, word search. However, it's this is a level three program. It does have academic rigor. So the instructions on this one, for example, says find the words, but then write your own description for each of the terms that will be on the other side of this sheet. So a word search, non-threatening kind of approach to remind them of some key terms, but then asking them to write their own description or um, explanation of what that term means would be an, you know the, the extension activity and and to take it to the to the level threeness um, of of the program that the TQ is. Okay, like I said, we're going to start summarizing and exploring what's in the chief examiner reports. So I know you'll be watching this as a recording, but we've got some questions that we asked on on the live session that we would like you to to consider. So think about what you can get from a chief examiner report. What generic advice or guidance or suggestions do they provide that you could actually use in the future? Because the chief examiner report is about a specific assessment. Uh, this, the questions that were in that exam or that employer set project. So how can we pick out from these reports some generic pointers or guidance that we can help to share with the students and prepare them for the assessments they're going to do. How can you use the information from the Chief Examiner Reports to, to support your students and, and help them with the preparedness for, for them? Um, 
we said at the time, what can you find in them that relates to what Janet and I have said already? We, we've based a lot of this session on what's in the Chief Examiner Report so that you can, you can benefit from hearing about it from multiple professionals who have got that objective view, but have some subject knowledge that we can apply to it um, and you can use the information to individualize your student support um, and, and revision activities and preparation activities for the core assessments there are key messages and there are common commonalities which you'll you'll see um, if if you were to have a look at the report and we'll, we'll show you which one um, it, it actually relates to and then how does the content of the reports relate to the assessment objectives and then how can you use that as teachers how can the students use it in your own assessment, feedback, feed forward, et cetera, et cetera, to, to develop their readiness? The next slide here, um, I'm going to get all of the answers up because we've pulled apart the different sections and, and what the Chief Examiner Report said about each of the, the four sections in, in the last paper. So this all relates to the examinations that were sat by students in last year's summer series. So this would have been June 2023. Um, recommendations was to encourage the students to draw upon their experiences. The def defining of key terms is really important and in, in the elements in, included in section A, focusing on educational theories. We've already talked about the age range. It's zero to 19 for the course. So making sure that the, the learners are uh, reminded that it could the questions in the papers could apply uh, relate to not to 19 and back to that really important application of theory to practice for section b we've got that repetition of applying that knowledge and understanding to those varied uh, contexts and scenarios remembering the statutory guidance and what that tells them and what that says the range of factors and not just focusing on one factor, there could be a number of factors that impact on the question or the scenario that the, the students are being faced with, and then fully, fully developing their explanations, not leaving anything out, not, not assuming that the examiner knows that they know something. They really have to be encouraged to make sure that they fully explain and develop the points that they make. In section C, it, it goes on to the behaviour and how, how, how child and, um, and everybody's behaviour impacts on others. So this was, was a question that was directly related to a scenario or a case study of how a child was behaving and how it impacts on the, the classmates and, and everybody else around them. Positive and negative reinforcement strategies. Um, I think a lot of the, the answers in previous papers focused on, on negative or positive and uh, Show, the learner shown knowledge of both is really important. Back to those age appropriate strategies and the differences in range of ages and, and what happens at different ages. And then of course, promotion and modeling of positive behaviors and how a teacher or an early years educator can be um, a role model, a positive role model for, for those around them. And then section D, partnership working, how important it is, how it's used and how effective it can make things. And if it falls down, what are the implications? What happens? What support is available for everybody involved? So that would be in a case study type question. They really have to show understanding of the key terms. Uh, really important for them to do so. And the, the really interesting last point there related to social media was that the students were able to apply their own experience of social media to a question if they didn't have any real life industry experience of doing so. They could bring in um, their own knowledge. They wouldn't necessarily say, I went through this, but they would be able to say, ah, I know, I know as an individual that social media impacts on on what happens. Um, so they could write about social media in the wider context uh, using their own experience because they hadn't necessarily had it in practice. And we'll quickly do the same for paper B. Uh, I'll just get all the answers up again. Janet, while I'm getting these all up, is there anything else that I might have missed there on paper A? No, absolutely not. I think you gave a really good overview and it does bring to point really um, things that the chief examiner um, and, and the examiners, of course, are bringing out from their findings. So, yeah, great stuff. Lovely. Thank you. So I'll do the same for paper B now. And this is the same summer series of last year. Um, 
obviously straight into demonstrating and applying knowledge of the stages of child development and um, the different stages and the different um, milestones, uh, etc. So really uh, demonstrating that understanding and knowledge of child development over that age range of 0 to 19. Um, providing definitions in relation to the theories that they're asked about or the frameworks that they're writing about. Um, so they're showing their knowledge and understanding and able to apply it. Understanding of expected milestones again, strategies, and making those reasoned judgments. We keep going back to this term, and it's it's a term that we see a lot in the chief examiner's reports. It's it's backing up um, the points that the students are making with something. Why? It's it's getting back to that why. For section B, specific answers rather than generalizations um, got the higher marks. So please encourage students to, to be very specific about what they're writing about and why they're writing about it, rather than making more sweeping generalizations. You know, the questions have um, a target, they have an area that they're specifically asking about. So making sure that the students are encouraged to be very specific in their answer and fully explain them and provide those reasons which support that the the points that they're making it keeps coming back and back through all of the exams. Um, for section C, they acknowledge a very general positive attitude towards inclusion and how different types of discrimination take place. And there was a strength and depth in in students' ability to do that in last year's papers. Um, and they also a lot of the students wrote about how it's really important to have a policy, a really robust policy when it comes to equality, diversity and inclusive, inclusive practice. So those were strengths. So please continue to encourage your students to, to develop the knowledge and understanding and applying it when it comes to the elements covered in Section C. Then for Section D, there was an acknowledgement of positivity and sensitivity demonstrated by the students um, and that understanding of accessibility and, and, and the requirements of EDI. The, the students had some very insightful responses um, about specific support, support roles in that was in a, a given case study again. Um, although there was some confusion over wording uh, related to the resources that they were writing about or the strategies that were writing about. So, as I say, this is very much based on last year's exam, but there are some generic pointers and, and some important um, points that you can take forward uh, to help students in the future as well. I'm going to hand back over to Janet now for the ESP Chief Examiner Report Summary. Thanks, Helen. OK, so let's let's take a look at this. So students achieving those higher marks were able to apply their knowledge and understanding to the assessment criteria. OK, so how are they doing that? Let's have a look at the ways that they are being able to do that. The more detail, the better. So they're applying that knowledge and understanding in detail um, quality over quantity. Um, we know this, so it's about what's being said, what's being explained, is it relevant, is it in context, is it taking the conversation further, is it building from assessment objective one, two and three. Um, are we able to draw from examples from industry? And they did, as we've said, all the way through that importance and the significance of, um, of placement and being able to see things in context is so important in technical education. The importance of each student's evidence being labelled, saved and uploaded um, in, to the portal in, in the correct way. So simple things like that are really helping to, um, to, to make things more straightforward overall, really. And so they stress the importance of that. So not necessarily from a marks point of view, but from that straightforward logistics point of view. Students should take into account all of the information available to them. So thinking wider, thinking what's this about? What's this scenario asking? And what's applicable to that from what I've learned across those 12 um, elements? And really thinking about that demonstrating knowledge and understanding of theory underpinning completion of the task while also considering how theory impacts on practice so bringing in element two in this case and being able to show that um, and remembering um, the, those core skills of course of being able to make those links and how they make those links in context to the scenario the most effective plans 
clearly addressed the child or the young person's holistic development and support needs. So whilst there is a focus, we're thinking about, did we mention the child's interests? Have we built around that? How is that also going to impact holistically um, for that child or group of children? And students should remember, remember we've talked about the core skills, but there's also those competencies. So um, elements of, of maths from any interpretation of data and so on, the way that things are presented in the digital skills and all the way through we talk about that qualification, um, that, sorry, the quality of written communication. And also, of course, that can be seen during that presentation, but also through that checking um, of, um, of, of spelling and so on. So being encouraged to revise and redraft their plan based on peer feedback. You remember that second layer on Helen's slide that talked about how they're going to um, be discussing their activity plan with their peers and giving feedback and receiving feedback on their own activity plan and then being able to, to revise their um, their, their activity plan based on that feedback and making clear links to what the, how they've been able to use that feedback to inform them and to move things move things forward taking part in a discussion not only to present their um their, their their plan but not using cue cards i think helen mentioned this earlier about not being too reliant on things we're moving a discussion forward you're going to be um so supportive in that manner and being able to have a professional discussion as if we were in an early year setting or in a classroom and we're thinking about how did you know what why did you plan that what, what did you have in mind for that particular child and you can use the questions that are there at your discretion to be able to support that student and, and to move the discussion forward with them. So reflective accounts and not lists or, or, of task activities. So thinking about how they approach the question, what is being um, asked for, or how do we approach it? So the fullness of, of how they approach those questions. Let's just take um, a look on the, on the next slide there. I think we, we're going to summarize um, the core. So I'm happy to take us through this, Helen, if you like. So exploring a sample answer. So we've got an example here um, that will help and you'll be able to, to, do, to do this and you, um, in your own time really and think about this. But what we did when we were looking at this live is people were working in, in small groups and networking, weren't they, Helen, and thinking about yeah. here's, the, here's the question. Um, can we pick out how it's about raising your confidence now when you're thinking about making those professional judgments judgments in terms of um, you know your mock paper or a classroom formative based approach and, and preparation through through um, a mock paper or something like that or just in normal classroom activities so here we've got a question around Emily we've got a student answer for Emily here a typical student answer for the situation that we've got there in question six and then we're looking at as um, as an examiner, you'd put yourself into into those shoes, really, and think, okay, how is this student demonstrating knowledge, applying knowledge, analysing and evaluating? And so this is just one example, and you could use any question. You could think about what's available already. You could make up questions around your the teaching and learning that's going on um, at the moment. You could consolidate lots of different themes and uh, through a case study type approach and you could begin to answer um, you know some of these questions with your students and ask them indeed to think about okay remember AO1, AO2, AO3, if that's the kind of type of, of question that's being set. And this, of course, is that uh, 12 mark question. And you can see there that in total it's 15 because we've got three marks for the quality of written communication. Um, as, as we move on, you, you could take your, your time when you're doing this together to be able to identify evidence of assessment objective one, assessment objective two and assessment of um, assessment objective three. Can you pick any of those out? What about identifying any gaps 
in the knowledge for this student. So you're giving feedback that's going to support them and you're giving feedback in relation to those different assessment objectives or indeed the relevance of the answer and the appropriateness of the answer. So you're, you're supporting and guiding that student all the way through and thinking about that feedback, how you would approach that. What links can you make to the objectives and the verbs? What links can you make to that, um, to, to the wider um, um, core elements, for example, and what could be brought in? What makes it what it is? What's missing? How could that student improve and work through the AO1 to the AO3? Maybe they're at the AO2, maybe they're at AO1, and this is okay. So how could you encourage them to perhaps think about the next natural step in their learning? And this can be it's expressed through this um, the, the band descriptors here. And you could use this to help you. So this is going to help you to, to sort of say, okay, this was a question around evaluation. If somebody is going to be stuck around that assessment objective one, their evaluation is probably going to be quite limited in its effectiveness and relevance. So it's going to pick up some marks, however, if the knowledge and understanding uh, of how this could be applied is it's it's um, it might well be minimal, but it's there. So it's at assessment objective one, for example, we're describing we're defining something rather than being able to take it to the next step. So you've got that range, which is always why it's important that a student attempts this and maybe works their way through that structure. I think on one of the slides it says analysis, evaluation, have a go. So I think if they if the student gets used to those building blocks, they, they will find that they're having a go quite incidentally. And without going through these bands, I'll let you um we'll let you read those in your own time, but you can see that that takes you all the way up to um, the marks, um, the 12 marks there at the top. And you can work, these are the, the things that might give you an idea, give you some hints and tips when you're, um, when you're making those professional judgments. So there are some things there that would help you to be able to work your way through those descriptors. And you know, you can see straight away, right, well, are we identifying what we mean by behaviorist approaches? And that might be something um, that's at that sort of first uh, rung, if you like. And then are we including strategies? Are we thinking about this? Has the student included any strategies? And have they made reasoned judgments? And it's always important to, to remember that reasoned judgment because we will, the examiners will um, accept other appropriate responses. So this is not an exhaustive list by any means. So it's about the relevance, it's about the context, it's about the breadth of knowledge and understanding, and it's about being able to apply that uh, in an appropriate way at um, a certain level and depth. Absolutely, thank you, Janet. And I think what's really useful um, is being able to do this with students as well, you know, having sample answers and asking the students to to mark them, use the grading table to to justify a mark that they would give, and that will help them develop their knowledge and understanding of how to respond to a question and gain those maximum marks. Absolutely. Okay, we're nearly at the end of today's session, but we are going to share one more thing with you that we that we did in the live session, and it was related to feedback to, to learners, but also feed forward. Uh, and we did ask everybody, what's the difference? Um, and I'm just talking for a little while while you, you think about it and consider what is the difference between feedback and feed forward? Uh, we've all heard the terms assessment of and assessment for learning. And one of them is for assessment of a certain point uh, where the student is at at a certain position or point in, in the learning. But assessment for learning provides feed forward uh, and we, we just shared one strategy that um, we have used and I have used uh, to to do this in a, in a previous FE teaching role and it was something called the AIMS approach you can see the table on the screen now and we asked everybody what they thought the AIMSS stood for uh, I'm going to explain what they are the A is for achievement so that's the assessment of learning what 
has a piece of work or an assessment activity shown that the student has achieved, is competent in, or knows to you know enough, enough depth to, to pass up an assessment activity. The I is about improving it. So we're moving into the feed forward now. If the student was to do this again, what would make it better? What would improve that piece of work, that assessment activity? But generally, they will learn something related to development of their skills and knowledge in every assessment. So the M stands for moving forward. So we're not talking about doing this piece of assessment again. We're talking about what can you learn from completing that assessment activity that you can take forward into future learning activities or future assessment activities. So that's the first M. And the first S, sorry, um, is what skills have been shown and what needs to be developed. So that might be technical skills, but it might also be English, maths and digital skills. So what have you, what have you seen in, in that assessment of that work? And what would you give advice wise to students for, for going forward and developing those skills further? Now, the last S is not for the teacher to do, it's for the student to do. And it's a case of what student action will be taken on the basis of this feedback and feed forward. Uh, and the student would therefore fill this in. They would read the notes, they would have a chat with the, the person who had provided that feedback and feed forward, and they would come up with a list of, or a brief list, a, a bullet point list, a couple of sentences about what they're gonna do with this feedback and feed forward. And we use this in an Ofsted inspection, and we were told by the Ofsted inspector, don't bother doing anything else if you don't do that last S. If you don't get the student to show that they've read, understood and engaged with that feedback and feed forward, well, don't bother doing it because that's the most vital part of this. Uh, the student action and what they're going to do with it um, is absolutely the, the focus of this type of feedback and feed forward. So every organisation has their own preferred way. This is a way that um, we piloted and used in, as a CNFE college that I worked in. But I said really liked it and then um, took that on board. Okay, we're on to closing messages. So we're at the end of the session. As you can see on the screen now, where there are a few um, playlists, uh, web links. We have the Education Earlier play playlist where you'll you'll find this recording, but you'll find everything else we've ever done for Education Early Years T level, and, and that goes back four years now. We've got the website address for future event bookings, so for future CPD activities and, and dropping clinics, uh, best practice networks, et cetera. You can register the, for them all through the NCFE website and the website address there for this qualification is there as well. We have also put the provider development email address there for you. Um, but the most important thing is that we've got uh, an evaluation form and it's for our on-demand recorded sessions. So before you stop the, the video, before we get to the end of the video, if you could take a moment to use a smartphone or a tablet um, to scan that QR code and spend just a minute or two, it's, it's not a huge evaluation form, but a minute or two to tell us what's been useful, what has resonated, how it might impact on your practice, what you found useful, what you'd like us to do in the future. Um, if you can't scan the QR code, please drop us an email and we'll send you a link to the same form, the same evaluation form. Um, so provider.development at ncfe.org.uk is our email address. Please get in touch with us with any questions. That's if you're not already in touch with us, with Janet, Gemma or myself, um, in terms of getting support. Uh, I'm going to end what I'm saying now and I'm going to hand over to Janet for the, the final closing messages. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Helen. And a great thank you to everybody who's able to um, to, to listen to the webinar. Um, as, as Helen has said, please just keep doing what you're doing. Um, you're preparing your students all the way through your formative um, opportunities within the teaching and learning environment in your classrooms. The students are, are doing well, um, your students will do well, 
the um, an exam it is what it is and we can prepare for that and we can practice for that and we can employ those techniques and strategies and the employer set project is doing extremely well and it's about again it's about practicing and becoming familiar and not being too um, anxious about things like presentation skills or or even being um, being videoed or giving feedback and receiving feedback at, at, at um, such a young age is, is a difficult concept so all of those things um, you know and the reflective practitioner etc etc this is about um, you know what a level three I always say this don't I Helen you know what a level three student looks and feels like. feels like yeah yeah and and it's 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 absolutely what we're doing here so this is a professional a professional qualification taught by professional experts and students as they always have in education in early years will continue to thrive because of that so thank you for all your your time um today in in this session thanks Helen Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, stay well, uh, stay being wonderful and um, keep the T-level in education as successful as it has been by doing what you're doing and applying your skills and knowledge. OK, thank you. Thank you.